God's Wisdom for Today, a new daily devotional written by over 50 gifted pastors, including Dr. James Merritt. Begin each day with a devotion that's designed to help you open your heart and mind to the wisdom of God's Word as you study the Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes in a whole new way. Each week's devotions encourage you to journal what you learn and give you a fresh perspective on His Word for your life. God's Wisdom for Today makes a great gift for yourself or for your friends and family. Order now from Touching Lives for just $20. Call 1-800-413-1131 or online at touchinglives.org. Today on Touching Lives. One thing, you don't even know how huge those two words are. Those two words make all the difference in the world as you enter into a brand new year. Because see, Paul understood the power that comes in concentrating on just one thing. With hope and encouragement for life, this is Touching Lives with James Merritt. I I personally believe that every year God gives us, He expects two things out of us. Number one, to be as productive as we can for His work, to do something meaningful for Him, and then to be as pleasing as we can be to Him for His glory. I don't think God ever puts us on this earth, even for a minute, just to waste it. We weren't put here to kill time. We were put here to use time. And frankly, the longer you live, if you're younger, you can't appreciate this as much as you can as you grow older, but the longer you live, the more you realize just how fleeting these years are. I mean, does it really seem like 365 days we watch that ball drop? I mean, you know, it just doesn't seem, it just, this year passed by, at least for me, faster than ever. And we only get so many of these to maximize the potential of becoming what we can be and doing what we can do. So at least half of us in this room are going to do something today if you haven't already done it. We know that one out of two Americans make New Year's resolutions. Now, doing that is a process that when you first do it can be very exhilarating, but at the same time, it winds up being very frustrating. I went back and did a little research. I just wanted to know what are the, you know, the typical resolutions that people generally make at the beginning of a new year. And according to USA.gov, these are the top 10 resolutions that Americans make every New Year's Day. Just see how many of them, at least whether you put them on paper or not, maybe they're in your mind. How many of them you'd say, yeah, that's kind of a New Year's resolution for me. By the way, before we put them up, what do you think is the number one New Year's resolution people make? What do you think? Lose weight. That's right. All right. Some of you need to make that resolution. I'm not going to point out who, but some of you desperately need to do that. All right. Number one, lose weight. Number two, manage debt, save money. Number three, get physically fit. Number four, eat healthy. Have you noticed how three of the first four kind of all kind of go together? Lose weight, get fit, eat healthy. Number five, learn something new. For some of you, that would be to learn how to lose weight and eat healthy and get physically fit. (laughs) Number six, for some of us, drink less alcohol. Number seven, quit smoking. Number eight, reduce stress. Number nine, take a trip somewhere. And number 10, volunteer to help others. Now, frankly, those are all very good resolutions. I really can't find fault with any of those to to speak of. Here's where the frustration sets in. Four out of every five people that make New Year's resolutions will break them. As a matter of fact, one out of three won't even get to the end of January until they've broken every one that they made. Seriously, one out of three just, I mean, fail. It's just fail. And, and so I kind of thought to myself, what we ought to do is not make a New Year's resolution. What we really need is a New Year's revolution. I, I think that maybe we ought to go into a New Year changing the way we look at life and changing the way we really think about things. And so that's what we're talking about over the next two weeks in this little mini-series that I'm calling one thing. But I want to go back to a question. And it's, it's a big one for me because I've always been a goal setter. And I believe the most productive people in life set goals and make goals and keep goals. And the, the question is, why do people fail to keep New Year's resolutions? I mean, your intentions are good. You mean well. Nobody, I, I don't think anybody sits down deliberately to make a bunch of goals you're not going to keep. So the question is, 
Why is it that so many of us make these resolutions and then we fail to keep them? Or even a bigger question is this. Why do so many of us come to the end of one year carrying the same baggage we were carrying when we started the year to begin with? Why is it that we come to the end of the year and we look back and we know we're no further along in our spiritual life, we're no further along financially, we're no further along in our marriage, we're no further along physically, we're no further along vocationally than we were the year before. I mean, the date changes, but the destination doesn't seem to. Well, a Florida State professor did a study of this because he was curious. Why do people make resolutions and not keep them? Why can't they keep resolutions? And he gave two reasons why people fail to keep New Year's resolutions. I think he's right on target. Number one, resolutions are too general. For example, you made a New Year's resolution. You're going to lose weight. You're not going to keep that resolution. You know why? Nothing's dynamic unless it's specific. How much weight are you going to lose? And when do you intend to lose it by? And how are you going to lose that weight? That's how you begin to really crystallize a resolution. Well, first of all, resolutions too general. Then he said this. Second reason, there are too many resolutions. You, you make too many goals. So here's what he said. I'm quoting. Studies suggest that willpower is a limited resource. If you make too many resolutions, you won't have enough willpower reserves to stick to all of them. Now, I want to throw up his conclusion on the screen because this really is kind of what my message is all about today. Listen to what he said. He said it is better to make one resolution and stick to it than to make five. Now, whether he realizes or not, he stole that right out of the playbook of the Apostle Paul. And I want to show this to you. If you brought a copy of God's Word, there's a book in the New Testament called Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. And in this passage of Scripture, I want to share with you just two simple verses today that are going to share with you and me how we really can make. But let me just stop and ask you a question. It's a dumb question. I realize it's dumb, but it really ought to be asked. I mean, let's assume that God's going to give every one of us 365 days. Let's assume we're not going to die this year, that we're actually going to live this year out. Simple question. Don't you want this to be the best year you've ever had? I mean, who wouldn't? Don't you want to be closer to the Lord this year than you've ever been? Don't you want to have a better marriage than you've ever had? Don't you want to have a better relationship with your kids than you've ever had before? Don't you want to be a better employer, a better employer than ever? Don't you want to manage your money much more wisely than you've ever done before? In every way imaginable, if you could, wouldn't you say, well, sure, I want this to be the best year possible. Well, Paul tells us exactly how to do that. Now, before I read these verses, I want to give you the background of this story because it makes the verses even more meaningful. Paul was writing from a Roman prison, and he did not know but that every day would be his last day. In a real sense, every day for Paul was New Year's Day because he did not know but, okay, this may be my last day. As a matter of fact, we now know looking back at history, he didn't get out of the prison alive. He was beheaded. He never saw the light of freedom again. And so he gives us a secret on how to make every new year your best year. But let me tell you what he does at the beginning. He begins by making a very candid admission, which you're going to have to begin with if you're going to make this year your best year ever. He makes a very candid admission about how to make your life better on a daily basis. Listen to what he says now in Philippians 3 verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Now, here's what Paul does. It's very, very refreshing. Paul, as great a man as he was, as great a preacher as he was, as great a missionary as he was, as great a Christian as he was, Paul, right off the bat, he's saying, let me just tell you something right now. I haven't arrived yet. I am by no means perfect. I, I've still got a lot of traveling I've got to do. I've still got a lot more to do. Even though I've been to a lot of places, there's still a lot more places I need to go. Even though I've reached a lot of my potential, I've not reached all of my potential. And by the way, I don't care how old you are. You may be in your 60s or your 70s, or your 80s or, or whatever. My mom's 91 years old. You, you know, you may be kind of, you say, man, I've been on this earth a long time. I don't care how long you've been on this earth. I don't care how much education you've got. I don't care how successful you've already been. As long as you're drawing a breath, there are always lessons you can learn. There are always new principles you can apply. There's always more room to grow. So here's what Paul does. He does us a big favor. He gives us three simple steps on how to make this year your best year. 
And by the way, what I'm going to share with you today, they're very, very simple. There's nothing profound about them. But what he's going to share with us today, you can do at the beginning of every year. You can do at the beginning of every month. You can do at the beginning of every week. You can do at the beginning of every day to make that day, that week, that month, that year, the best year you possibly can. So three things, you can write these down real quickly. Number one, Paul said, first thing you ought to do at the start of a new year, forget what is behind you. Step one, forget what is behind you. Listen to what he says in verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. You cannot focus on where you need to go until you forget where you've been. Paul had in mind life's like a race, and every day is a brand new lap in that race. And every month is a brand new lap, and every week and every year you're just running another lap, and you need to run the best that you can. I remember one time, the only, I only ran a race one time. I, I never have really cared to run. I, I like to get on the Stairmaster and all that. I just, I just don't, never have been, you know, much into running. But I remember several years ago, pastoring another church, I, I, got, I, I ran a, three, a, a 5K. And that's, I think it's like three miles or something like that. I really and truly, I thought I'd run a marathon when that thing was over. I'll just tell you, if you're a runner, I mean, five, you guys that do something, we got people here that run the Peachtree Road Race. I mean, I just think people are nuts that do things like that. But that's okay. That's, that's, that it's, it's, this is why it's America. It's free to be nuts. But anyway, I just, I'm not, that's not merit. But I'm telling you, I trained and I ran and, and, and I, I thought, I, I kept telling my buddy to run with, I said, I can't make this. It's just too, I, I just hate it. He said, Pastor, we're going to do it. He says, here's, and then he said this to me. He said, just remember as you run, where you've been is not important. What is important is where you are and where you're headed. I thought about that every stinking kilometer of that five-kilometer run. I'm not kidding you. Where you are, where, where, where you've been is not important. It's where you are, and it's where you're headed. Now, that's true about your own life. You cannot sail the ship of your life into the seas of the future with joy and peace if your anchor is stuck in the mud of the past. You can't run forward if you're always looking backward. That's why Paul said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to forget those things which lie behind me. Now, before I go further and give you the second point, you need to understand what Paul was saying, what Paul was not. When Paul said, I'm forgetting those things which lie behind, to forget does not mean to fail to remember. I mean, let me just state the obvious. There is no way you can totally forget your past. There, there's no way you can ever totally forget the mistakes that you've made and the, and the failures that you've had and, 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 and the things that you've done that, that, you, you know, that you really wish that you had not done. But when you study that word, it really helps because that's not what the word forget means. The word forget in the Greek language does not mean to fail to remember. What that word literally means is to not be influenced by or not be affected by. Let me give you an illustration. The Bible says in the Old Testament that when God forgives our sins, he makes a promise. He says, I will remember your sins no more. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden God gets spiritual amnesia. It doesn't mean that he gets some kind of a spiritual Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean that he all of a sudden gets a bad memory. What it means is when he says, I will not remember your sins anymore, what he's saying is, I will no longer let what you did in the past affect my relationship with you. I will no longer let that color the way I see you and the way I think about you. I heard about a man that went to see his doctor. And he said, doctor, he said, you, you got to help me. I got a problem. And the doctor said, what's wrong? He said, I'm suffering from amnesia. What should I do? The doctor said, just go home and forget about it. Now, <laughs> That, that's really what you need to do. And you think about those things that you did do that you should not have done. Here's what you've got to do. You say, okay, what can I learn from my mistakes? What can I learn from my failures? What can I learn from my flaws? How can I let that make me a better person? And then you forget about it and you move on. And by the way, let me just tell you a little secret. Do you know how you can really know when you've really forgotten about things in the past? This is big. This is going to really shock some of you. You know that you've really put your past behind you when you can talk about it. If there's something in your past you can't talk about, you haven't forgotten it. But if you can look at your past, and I don't care how bad it is, if, you, if somebody brings up something about your past and you can look at that person, you can say, you know what, I did do that. I am guilty of that. But, you know, let me tell you what God taught me. Let me tell you what I've learned. Let me tell you how I've grown through that. Then you know you've forgotten that which is 
behind you. All right, that's step one. Forget what's behind you. Step two, focus on what's in front of you. Focus on what's in front of you. Now listen to the verse again, brothers. I do not consider that I've made it my own, but, now these two words are big. I want you to underscore these words. Matter of fact, one thing, say that out loud. One thing, let's say it again. One thing. You don't even know how huge those two words are. Those two words make all the difference in the world as you enter into a brand new year. Because see, Paul understood the power that comes in concentrating on just one thing. If you don't think those two words are important, just think about how important those words are in the Bible. A rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You remember what Jesus said to him? One thing you lack. When Martha and Mary were having this big argument over whether Mary ought to be cooking in the kitchen or sitting at the feet of Jesus, Jesus looked at Martha and he said, Martha, only one thing is needed. David said in Psalm 27, 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek. Well, the question is, what was the one thing that Paul was seeking? Listen to what he says in verse 14. I press on toward the goal. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The Greek word for goal is the word skopos. We get the word scope or the word telescope from that. And, and what that word literally means, it means a small mark that you fix your eye on. It's, like, it's, like, it's kind of like a hunter looking at a bullseye. If you're, if you're, if you're a hunter and, and, and you know, if you hunt deer or, or whatever it is, but you know, deer hunters, for example, you've got a, a spot right behind the left shoulder that deer you're focused on. You're not looking at the antlers, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the nose. You're not looking at the, 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 the hips. You're not looking at anything else. There's that one little circle behind the left shoulder of that deer. That's what you're focused on. That's what that word literally means. It means to fix your eye on just one thing. And what Paul was saying was the key to living a productive life, the key to getting the, the, the most out of life that you can is to focus. When you go to live your life, if you want to make the most of it, you got to focus. Don't live your life like a shotgun where you're just blasting, hoping something will stick on the wall. Find those things that are really, really important to you and focus on those things. You know, somebody might say, well, Paul had a one-track mind. Maybe he did, but it was on the right track. That's the point. He said, this one thing I do. I am convinced one of the reasons why so many Christ followers are so ineffective in their Christian life is because they, they, they're trying to do too many things. One of the reasons why so many churches are ineffective in their mission is they, they, they try to do too many things. They don't really concentrate on one thing. Anybody knows that concentration is the secret of power. You, you, you take a river. If you let that river overflow its black banks, it will become a swamp. But if you will take that river and make sure that river stays between two banks, it can power a dam that can give electricity to an entire city. We now know we can take a light beam, just a light beam. And if you will just focus that light beam on one thing, you can turn it into a laser that can cut through steel. See, the key is to focus on a goal, but make sure you're focusing on the right goal. That's really important. I was reading the other day about a football coach. And he was trying to teach his little six-year-old son how to become a place kicker. He said I, I, he wanted his boy to be a place kicker. So he took his little six-year-old boy out to the front yard, and he said, now, son, I'm going to teach you how to, how to kick. And so he got down on his knees, and he put the ball down. You know, he got down on his knees, you know, put the, put the ball down. And, and, and like this, he put it down, and he said, now, said to his six-year-old son, he said, now, when I nod my head, kick it. That's how he lost his two front teeth. <laughs> now, you, you got to focus on the right goal. It's not a no focus on the goal. you got to focus on the right goal. And so in that spirit, in that spirit, now listen, I've worked hard on this sermon. Hang with me. I mean, work with me here. In that spirit, we're asking our entire church this year to do one thing. Now, I'm not saying it's the only thing, but I'm saying it's the one thing. you. If you said to me, okay, I'm going to do one thing as a member of this church. I'm going to do one thing as a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to do one thing as a practitioner of Christianity this year. We're going to ask you this year to read the Bible through. Now, let me tell you why I'm going to ask you to do that. 
I know the majority of you have never read your Bible through one time. And it's not one of those things I, I'm just trying to get you to check off and say, okay, well, I know what he's trying to do. At least I'll always be able to say when I die, well, I read my Bible through one time. Frankly, if the Bible is God's Word, I don't know why you want to go to heaven and have God say to you, now, did you hear everything that I had to say? Well, not really. Since the Bible is the Word of God, and since God primarily speaks to us through His Word, and since God has even made a promise that the truth of God's Word can transform, not inform, can transform your life on a daily basis, I thought nothing will make a greater difference in the life of our people than if they could hear God speak to them every single day. I want you to open that Bible every day with one belief. I am going to believe that God is going to speak to me today. That there's something, it may be in Chronicles, it may be in Luke, it may be in Proverbs, it may be in Psalms, it may be, but somewhere, somehow, God is going to speak to me today. And just focus on that one thing, because I'm absolutely convinced the greatest single thing I can do on a daily basis is to hear God speak to me through His Word. Because there's nothing that feeds my heart. There's nothing that motivates my, encourages my spirit. There's nothing that motivates me to live for Jesus. There's nothing that grows my love for God like getting into His Word and reading His Word. So, I'm going to ask you to focus on that one thing. Then here's the last thing. Step three, fulfill what is ahead of you. Forget what's behind you, focus what's in front of you, and then fulfill what's ahead of you. Now listen to this. Two times, once in verse 12 and once in verse 14, Paul says this, I press on. Now I want to stop because I'm going to make this real practical. The reason why some of you are pretty much determined you're not going to do what I'm asking you to do and read your Bible through is because you're thinking, I can't do it. I know what will happen. I'll start, and I'll get into it, and three or four days I'll do it, and then one day I'll forget, and I'll mix up, and I'll get two days behind, and I'm just not going to do it. Let me tell you this. If you'll take that one word I just used and make it a positive and not a negative, you can do it, and that word is determined. If you will right now in your heart determine, if I don't do anything else this year, if I don't do anything else for the Lord, I may not go on a mission trip. I may not pray like I ought to. I may not serve like I ought to serve, but I'll tell you one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to press on. I am determined. See, here's our problem. Baby boomers have a problem. And I'm one of them, and I know. See, we've been raised to view success as something that, 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 that's easy. And so our, our generation doesn't know a whole lot about determination and about perseverance and, and, and about I endurance. And so this is the attitude. I mean, we, we just have it. Let's be honest. You know, if, if the boss gets unreasonable, you just quit. If the subject gets too difficult, you just drop out of class. If the marriage gets unbearable, you just get a divorce. Uh, that's kind of our mentality. Well, what I'm saying to you today is this. I'm going to ask you to take a totally different tactic. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible today, beginning today, and say, this one thing I am going to do. If I don't do anything else today, I'm going to read my Bible. If I don't do anything else tomorrow, I'm going to read my Bible. If I don't do anything else every day this year, I am going to read this book. And when I come to the end of this year, I will at least be able to look at the one laser-focused thing I said I would do and say, this one thing I did. The one thing I never thought I could do, I did do. The one thing I've never done, I was finally able to do, and I'm going to do it this year. The one thing that makes it possible for us to go to heaven, Jesus Christ, His sacrifice on the cross, His resurrection from the dead. His offer of eternal life, all because of one thing. One thing makes that a reality for us, which is our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. One thing is more important than anything else for everyone on this planet. And that is you live every day of your life ready to meet the God that made you. Ready to meet the God that created you. And ready to stand face to face with the God that put you on this earth to begin with and give an account of your life in which he can look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant.
the one thing the Bible says you must do before you're ready to live, much less ready to die. The one thing, not two, not three, not four, the one thing you have to do is to surrender all that you are to all that Jesus is. And once you do that one thing, he will do this one thing. Transform your life. Change you into what you ought to be. So you can do what you ought to do. And so that when you leave this earth, you can go where you need to go. So the question is, would you be willing not to talk about it, not to dream about it, not to hope about it, but would you be willing to do that one thing this year to make this year the best year you've ever had? Oftentimes, when we make resolutions that we can't keep, it's because we have too many commitments and we lose focus. Sometimes it's because we believe we'll fail even before we start. If you find yourself overwhelmed today and you'd like to talk to someone and be encouraged, we're here for you. Call us at 1-800-413-1131. One resolution you can make this year is to read the Bible in its entirety. You can get our one-year Bible reading plan today at touchinglives.org. Simply click on the Daily Devotions link on the left-hand side of the homepage and choose the one-year Bible reading plan. It's absolutely free and shows you what passages to read each day this year in the Old and New Testament to easily read through the entire Word of God. You can also receive a free copy of the one-year Bible reading plan sent to you by mail. Request yours today by calling 1-800-413-1131. When making New Year's resolutions, many of us overcommit ourselves year after year, setting ourselves up for disappointment and failure. But did you know that the Bible gives us steps to succeed when we decide to accomplish a goal? Order your copy of One Thing and learn the tools and practical advice necessary to set yourself up for success. Order your copy today. CDs $7, DVDs $12 at touchinglives.org. Or call us at 1-800-413-1131. We hope you had a happy Merry Christmas just like we did in our family. I can assure you with Presley and Harper, it was not a dull Christmas. But we want to say as we enter into a brand new year and draw this year to a close, thank you for supporting our ministry and praying for us. And we just want to ask you again to prayerfully consider giving to our matching grant campaign. For every dollar that you give, it's double because of some very generous donors to this ministry. It gives us a rocket boost, and we want this year to be our greatest year in reaching people for the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we close out an old year and get into a new year, there's one last thing that we want to say to you today. And Harper, what do we want to say? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Keeping a New Year's resolution takes a great deal of effort, but to really be successful, we need the encouragement and support of those around us. That's what we experience at Touching Lives. Because of your faithful prayers and financial support, we're able to keep our resolution to share the hope and encouragement of Jesus Christ with millions each week. Thank you. Touching Lives.